In addition to offering blowout deals like 2014 Silver American Eagles for only $239 over spot for any quantity, SD Bullion is excited to offer our customers exclusive specials that you won't find anywhere else. SDB was able to secure a sealed Munster box of each of the 5 ounce America the Beautiful coins released by the U.S. Mint in the inaugural year of 2010. The stunning collector's coins commemorate Yellowstone, Yosemite, Hot Springs, Mount Hood, and the Grand Canyon. Only a very limited quantity was reportedly released by the U.S. Mint, making the 2010 collection extremely rare and the most sought-after coins in the entire America the Beautiful series. Hurry as these coins are sold out nearly everywhere. 70 individual coins and 30 sets are available for order now on sdbullion.com. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Uh, joining us today is a special guest, uh, for a discussion on the topic of fiat money and the Federal Reserve, Dennis Linthicoma. Thanks for joining us, Dennis. You bet. It's great to be here. Okay, we'll get to that exciting topic shortly here. Um, but first, just a quick recap of the metals and markets this week. We had an explosive uh, action on Thursday. It seemed like all the action for the week was on Thursday with both gold and silver getting dumped in London trading just prior to the COMEX open and then uh, resulting in a outside reversal for the day with both metals spiking about 10 a.m. New York time. Gold spiked up towards uh, 1300 and actually cleared it uh, this afternoon uh, Friday and is closing the week after consolidating at the 1300 level throughout afternoon trading on Friday is closing the week above 1300. The silver also on Thursday spiked up to 20 and hasn't quite seen the same uh, follow through on buying uh, on Friday but uh, did recover um, all of its losses uh, in that iner initial smackdown, um, and this comes ahead of uh, the upcoming FOMC meeting. Uh, what's your thoughts, Eric, on uh, um, the crash and then smash? Yeah, yeah. The, it, it, it's uh, just another example of how where we get to uh, 19 and change in silver in the low end, and you know, gold drifting further and further below 1300, and then all of a sudden. You have Asian buying coming in, buying physical, putting pressure on the system, and then the people who are copycatting the cartel's pressure on the markets by following momentum with downside shorts, you know, the hedge funds, momentum players and whatnot. Uh, all of those guys, it appears, were behind uh, the short covering rally that happened. At first, you know, there was some initial buying after, on the dips, but then you can see just by the chart on Thursday's action the exact you know, 90 degree vertical line where you know, that's obviously short covering predominantly. You know, 90 percent plus of that buying is just a running of of uh, you know the limit orders in the system. So people are scrambling to cover their positions because they realize that there's a, a floor in this market. It's primarily defined by what's going on with the physical buying in Asia. And your point also about gold being stronger in these uh, after hours as we close Friday is uh, important as well, too, because it reflects the fact that gold is performing as a safe haven asset right now. People are interested in switching back to organic buying, whereas with silver it's mostly just going vertical and it hasn't gotten continued follow-through because uh, there's more or less a standstill between the shorts and the, and the people playing alongside of the market here as opposed to um, individuals and uh, financial institutions and whatnot looking to get a hedge uh, in advance of the weekend with all the craziness that's going on in Ukraine and Russia and so forth. And I should probably just throw out a brief note about that because, unfortunately, the media in the United States and Europe as well uh, continues to paint this picture as if it's uh, an example of uh, Putin and Russia being the primary aggressors when, in fact, we know as a documented fact that the United States has played a role in stirring up this hornet's nest because it saw the possibility of uh, pulling Ukraine further into the orbit of NATO and, uh, you know, and by extension also supporting uh, the dollar and having, uh, you know, a weakening strategy applied towards Russia. But, in fact, that's actually backfiring as many people in the hard money uh, sector under 
to understand when it comes to this whole discussion about the dollar reserve trade status and how you know Russia is now talking about doing direct deals with China and they're accelerating their interest, both Russia and China, when it comes to uh, establishing an alternative to the dollar reserve currency status system. So I mean, this is just another chapter in that whole evolving story, but uh, the tensions are escalating because basically the neocons in uh, Washington uh, understand and, and view the world in, in rose-colored glasses. They're really just you know, victims of hubris. They think that they can run an aggressive empire, which relates also to the topic of the Federal Reserve that we're going to get to later in the program um, because that's what, in fact, uh, enables that hubris. And so here we are. Uh, we're seeing tensions rise and rise and rise, and it's almost like uh, a big game of chicken that Washington is playing, and it's very dangerous. Eric mentioned that it's backfiring. It appears to be potentially in a very big way. Several Russian news outlets uh, overnight are reporting that uh, Russia, um, Kazakhstan, and Belarus are um, reportedly going to sign an agreement in May to accelerate the formation of a, an economic union and a joint currency um, called the Alten um, and move that up from, I think, 2025 when it was scheduled until up, what, 11 years until this spring. And interestingly, um, whether it's a symbolic gesture or not, uh, the word Alton uh, is actual, the de definition for it is gold. So it's, oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and all of this stuff, too, all this stuff relates to, you know, the other big story, too, about the CME, once you hit that. Yeah, the uh, other big story. The other big story this week was uh, the CME announcing plans to launch a physically settled Asian gold futures exchange, and they're still exploring the exact location of it. Sounds like it'll probably either be Singapore or Hong Kong, and really it's, in my opinion, it's uh, a move that they've finally seen the writing on the wall that the CME and the COMEX was going to become irrelevant due to physical demand taking over the market and physical Asian demand in particular um, with the Shanghai Futures Exchange launching and then Jim Sinclair's new exchange, the Singapore Mercantile Exchange opening as well. So in, in my mind, it's a move that the CME finally recognizes that they were being made irrelevant and it's a, a move to try to regain their, um, their market share and continue at least a portion of their volume. I know you have a little bit uh, different take on it, Eric. No, I, I, I think that last point is, is the key point, uh, at least for the short term. And then, obviously, when you set up a physical exchange, not everybody's going to be taking delivery on that exchange. So even though purportedly this is their effort to match the uh, credibility instilling uh, uh, you know, the factor of a physical exchange run by China and the Shanghai uh, Gold Exchange and the Singapore Gold Exchange under James Sinclair, you know, they will put a good foot forward, but ultimately this allows them to play more paper games because not everybody will take physical delivery on every contract. And again, it, it, the market share factor is, is something that they're trying to push forward as well, too, just to preserve their business. So that said, it's definitely a story to keep an eye on. And as we go forward, we'll, we'll cover it in future shows. That sounds good. Well, why don't we move into... Uh... Uh, discussing uh, our main topic for the show today of uh, fiat money in the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and I should introduce Dennis. Uh, Dennis Lindicum, he's a current sitting commissioner in Klamath County. And Dennis's background is uh, you know, the one in which he has understanding of economics and business. He's not really a traditional politician per se. He graduated from UCLA with a degree in economics. When it comes to the picture of the Federal Reserve, a lot of people in our audience really understand the problems that a fiat system instills, but you know the path to actually getting rid of the Fed is something that we've never talked about on this show, and that's why I thought it would be productive to bring Dennis on to not only talk about that and to reflect on what Ron Paul's uh, efforts have been over the years, but to also just talk about some of the political ramifications from a ground view, you know, he's a sitting commissioner and he can give examples of what he sees uh, when it comes to how people react to so-called free money. The Federal Reserve printing money in Washington impacts even a local economy and local uh, people in a community. So, Dennis, welcome. We'd love to talk to you about all these things, and it's great to have you here. 
Very good, Eric. You, you give a great introduction, and you, you filled it out nicely for people. I think um, the most important facet is y your audience has been on the cutting edge. They know and understand these issues. I face a different problem in my sphere. When you think about the local grocery store and the thousands of people that walk through the grocery store in your city or town, whether it's a big Walmart or a smaller store, Thousands of those people every hour don't realize what's going on. And the federal bureaucracy, the propaganda coming out of the government enterprise is enormous. And it's very difficult to, um, to, to get people to think seriously about how fiat money works. When you say audit the Fed and get rid of the Fed, you know, those kinds of two wrong Paul phrases, um, they they really just kind of quiver. They don't know what what that might look like and what might a um, what what would a currency look like that wasn't fiat based. And they just don't recognize how far we've come and uh, how how big a problem we face here in America. Um, so the real issue that we're facing is this printing press and creating free money. And buying allegiance, the power of the purse, is a super dangerous item that everyone in America ought to be wary of because the power of the purse is influencing federal policy across the land. I'm reminded of the Federal Register last year reaching 81,000 pages of uh, you know, you know, law that's not statutory law that's voted by uh, congressional debate and careful deliberation, if you can even call that what, is, what goes on in Congress. But it's more just the octopus of this you know, executive branch agency empire that's spreading across the land and basically impacting our lives in every which way possible. And then, you know, you can look at the foreign policy of the United States, and we essentially have an empire with over 800 military bases around the world and a very aggressive policy that is more in service of special interests and corporate interests, and frankly, you can even call it an oligarchy, uh, more so than the middle class of America. And all of this, all of it, is being uh, effectuated by the ability to run uh, based on fiat money. You know, it, it, people understand inflation, but it's a lot bigger than just inflation and a shaky monetary system that can fall apart because it's unstable. It basically has allowed this government to grow and grow and grow. Well, I'd love to have you speak to that, to maybe even give examples so that people can understand it. Well, yeah, here I'm, I'm in Oregon, um, in the southern part of Oregon, just above California, and, um, and Oregon is almost 54% owned by the federal government. They, it, and I actually think that that's um, bad nomenclature. The federal government doesn't really own it. It belongs to we the people. It belongs to you and I. But the federal go government is exercising jurisdiction over it. The U.S. Forest Service last year lost 9.3 million acres of forest, 9.3 million acres of animal habitat, 9.3 million acres of watershed, and um, and uh, clean and fresh and pure water. All of those pictures that everybody imagines in their mind's eye of a beautiful forest. They lost 9.3 million acres of that to forest fire and forest damage because they've not been managing it um, uh, effectively all this time because they've had a um, mindset that says we want to preserve the forest and they have an environmental bent towards preserving the forest. The truth is the forest should be uh, viewed as a crop like corn. It just takes 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, depending upon the variety of tree that you're growing, instead of a se single season for a crop of corn. And even in, you know, people who are growing corn will know that there's a 90-day variety and they've never had luck with the 68-day variety, et cetera. They have different um, germination patterns and uh, will grow in different varieties, in different temperatures, in different climates, at different elevations, with different speed. And so it's a real common way to view uh, ener energy in terms of um, thinking about how will we grow, consume, and utilize corn. 
And it's unfortunate that the federal government has this policy over the land because they can only do this kind of uh, mindless management with the fiat money machine. They can pay for their mistakes. They can buy allegiance. They can give $330 million annually to forested counties as they keep those forested counties out of the landscape. They keep them from harvesting in a sustainable manner the timber that's there. The only way they can implement that policy is by buying allegiance, by bringing paper money into the play, and by putting it on everybody's table and um, buying their complacency and compliance with a policy that's destructive. The same thing happens in healthcare. Everybody's familiar with Obamacare. The state of Oregon um, started uh, what they have been calling Cover Oregon, which is the enhanced Medicaid and Medicare position for the state to implement federal Medicare and Medicaid policy. The federal government gave Oregon $2 billion, paper money, made, pulled out of thin air, and they gave them $2 billion to implement this program. Quite frankly, nobody in the Oregon legislature would have gone for this except for there's all this money on the table. And, and the governor says, look at this free money, wink, wink, and everybody falls for it. So free money is a real, real problem. I face it everywhere I go. People are looking for grants. They're looking for money. They're looking for programs. And the only way the federal government can keep this mirage alive is keeping the printing presses going. You're attempting to get into Congress to address uh, multifaceted issues that are problems in our nation, but it's important to point out to people here that there are a number of people who are trying to get into the political system like Dennis who understand that the biggest problem of all is the money system and that it's fueling all of the other problems. The other problems, uh, arguably, would be much less, if not impossible, uh, if it were not for the fact that we have you know, the, the printing press going out of control and, and debt financing from future generations to building our government today. So can you reflect a bit on how you've learned about Ron Paul's uh, movement to uh, you know, audit the Fed and ultimately his position of ending the Fed? Well, my wife and I have uh, always been very libertarian-leaning, very conservative. I've got moral sideboards to my libertarianism, and the moral sideboards come from my Christian worldview. And, and, and yet, with those moral sideboards, I realize that government isn't the answer. It's your, your and my specific understanding of our moral obligations, our freedom of conscience, our individual liberty our ability to make judgments and act of our, in our own free will with our own uh, natural and voluntary association. This is the beauty of the marketplace, and this is what America is losing daily because of federal intervention. When we talk about health care, it's a giant federal intervening into the choices that people make. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that housing bubble was instigated through federal monetary policy. And now we're seeing it in the college education bubble. And we have more and more students who are getting bachelor's degrees that don't have any place to work because businesses aren't willing to step out. Businesses make decisions based on monetary and financial reality. They're looking at the math, they're paying attention to the numbers, and they don't like the uncertainty that they see. And the uncertainty that they see is the federal government may jump into your market on any Tuesday and give you the shaft. And they're tired of playing that game. So they're sitting on wads of cash considering uh, converting that into physical gold or or silver or wondering where else in the world to move. And then we hear complaints that our labor forces and our industry and our infrastructure is being moved offshore. And the phrase offshore comes up over and over and over again. 
look at money goes where money is welcome. And if money is welcome in some other country, it will flee to that other country. If it's not welcome here in America, our industry, our infrastructure, our capital will decline and we will be in a rust bucket before long if we don't turn this ship around. Intervention is the problem. We need to back government out of um, it, the momentum that it has gained in recent years for controlling, regulating, and managing every aspect of your life. Ask any one of your listeners to go to the store and buy a 100-watt light bulb, an incandescent bulb. They can't do it. And I'm asking why not. If there's a need in the market, there ought to be a, 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 the capacity within the market for a producer to provide that need. When you go to Congress, what do you think are your next steps if you are to be elected? What I'm suggesting we need is we need men and women of principle who understand that fiat money is a tragedy in our lifetime, and we need to, we need to really put the clamps down. America back to the point where we need to really be serious about managing our federal policy and managing the bankroll and creating a sound currency instead of pretending we can inflate our way out of every problem we come across. As a, as a constitutional conservative myself, I support your platform, and I very much hope to see you replace Greg Walden. So if people in our audience want to learn more about Dennis and his campaign, you can go to Dennis2014.com. That's Dennis. 2014.com. And we wanted, again, to present the ideas that Dennis is championing here because a lot of people in our movement, and people in the precious metals community overall, really understand the problems but don't often have a discussion about how we're actually going to get this thing fixed and uh, auditing and thereafter, ultimately, which will take time, uh, uh, you know, getting the Fed abolished is the end game that I think the precious metals community really has unified agreement on. And, you know, this is the third central bank that we've had in the United States, and it's the one that's lasted the longest, and fiat currencies tend to have only a 50-year lifespan at best, and the system that we have now is so unstable with the enormous shadow banking system and the derivatives complex that grows out of it that's easily into the, you know, <laughs> multi quadrillion level uh, in so you know th this needs to be addressed and if people want to fight for a restoration of the republic you need to have people who understand sound money and and you know getting rid of the fed in congress so uh, i would encourage people to learn more about Dennis's campaign we are finding more and more people who are paying attention to fiat money and the power that it gives the federal government that it denies from state government. So if you're wondering why your state government isn't exercising their rights and they're always getting pushed around, it's because the federal government is the guy who has the billy club. They manufacture the weapons, they carry the brawn, and they buy allegiance. So it's easy enough to buy a governor, buy a state senator, buy a state house or assembly, and by buying allegiance, the, you can simply bring more and more control into the federal arena. And this is something that we need to work hard at. It's a difficult problem, and we need good men and women to step to the forefront. Yeah, we couldn't agree more, Dennis. And before we wrap up the show here, give the listeners a quick weekly update on uh, the physical gold and silver markets here in the U.S. Um, with uh, the metals consolidating, um, the shortage is just about over uh, across all spectrums. Even the, um, the sunshine uh, mint uh, rounds and bars are um, starting to become available. And again, uh, the U.S. Silver Eagles are available across the authorized uh, purchasers. Um, some of the lowest premiums we've seen um, in a couple of years. Uh, a lot of the, the big, even retail dealers uh, have started a bit of price wars. Uh, at SD Bullion, we've been having special uh, all week on Silver Eagles at 239 over any quantity. That's the lowest we've ever sold them at. In, uh, You're starting the price war. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could be we're starting the price war, but... Um, <laughs> But really, uh, you're seeing it uh, across to some of uh, the bigger dealers as well. Uh, we're seeing APMEX offer prices that I've never seen 
uh, offer anywhere near. So just overall in the market, the retail demand is uh, down a little bit here from what it was in the beginning of 2014 and certainly from a year ago in 2013 where we saw massive widespread shortages across nearly every retail product, uh, at least in silver anyway. So really from a long-term perspective, it's my belief this is an excellent time to enter the market. There's not a lot of excitement or uh, momentum to the upside. So certainly your risk is greatly reduced uh, today versus back in 2011 or 2012 when all the momentum and uh, people were new to the market were chasing to the upside. Well, Dennis, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show today and wish you uh, the best of luck um, in your run here. Just wanted to uh, thank you for your time and coming on the show, Dennis. You bet. And I think all of our listeners will certainly agree with you, uh, the need to end the Fed as well. So to, to check out uh, Dennis, I believe it's uh, Dennis2014.com. Um, and uh, once again, Dennis, let's come. Uh, thanks for joining us on the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. The Dock's new investment option. Lead bullion. Buy your ammunition from the Dock today at sdbullion.com.